And welcome to Understanding Light in Photography, part three of a three-part mini-series of podcasts in association with Kakubri Galleries. Now, currently on display in the Mitchell Gallery in the Kakubri Galleries is part of the McKinnon Collection. The McKinnon Collection, the full McKinnon Collection, is about 14,000 photos strong. It's not as many of that in Kakubri at the moment. It's about three dozen or so. Um, but the McKinnon Collection is a collection of old photographs uh, gathered together by Murray McKinnon, um, which date from about the 1850s to the 1950s, so a century's worth of photographs. These photographs were recently acquired by a joint venture with the National Gallery Scotland and the National Library Scotland, and are currently being worked through and curated, and some of these are out on tour, which is where we end up at the uh, Kukubri Galleries. Now, Inspired by this collection of photos, Kukubri Galleries has decided to hold a competition in order to create a sort of Kukubri collection as such. One of the things we're very aware of in this day and age is photographs. Most photographs are very, very instantly consumable. We take photos on our phones, on our tablets, on whatever devices we've got. We upload them to social media. People scroll through them at high speed. We scroll through other people's at high speed. We're lucky if we spend more than a fraction of a second on any particular photograph. But we also know from our whole history of family albums that when you, have a, when you actually print out a photo, you look at it in a different way. And then if you happen to stick it in a frame, you look at it in a different way again, hang it on the wall in a gallery. So the idea of this Kakubri collection then is to create a set of images which later in the year will in fact be displayed in the gallery, in the Kukubri Galleries itself. Uh, currently, if you go to, well, if you go to the kukubrigalleries.org.uk or in the description if you are of uh, this YouTube, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this podcast, I've, I've put a link directly to the page. You can find the page where there's the um, terms and conditions and all the bits and pieces. Get your images in by the 28th of February, 5 p.m. Now, the point of these podcasts then is to give you some insights and ideas into improving your photography, getting across really the impact, the story that you want to tell. This is the third of three podcasts. On the first night, two, two nights ago on Tuesday, I talked about the notion of narrative in photography. And that's the idea of storytelling, of whenever you bring out your camera to take a photo of something, you had something in mind. There was a reason why you wanted to take that photograph. And if you're going to have somebody else look at that photograph, how well are you going to get that message across? The clearer you are when you pull out your camera or your phone to take that photo of what story it is you want to convey, actually the easier all the successive decisions you need to make become. So last night I was then talking about the notion of composition. Because you can have all the elements that you want in the photo, but how you arrange them can have a huge difference in the amount of impact that that photo has, in how well you actually convey the story. Can, do, does the viewer uh, look straight at the bit of the photo that you want them to, or is their eye being pulled off in many different directions at the same time, and therefore the photo isn't quite as satisfying and nobody bothers sticking with it quite so long? Tonight I'm talking about the notion of light. Now, there's an old saying in photography that um, when it comes to photography, the beginner thinks it's all about equipment. You know, have you got the right camera? What size lens have you got? All of that. And if you've got a better camera, you've got a better photo. The more advanced person thinks it's all about technique. You know, do I understand rule of thirds and the use of diagonals? Do I understand how to change my aperture settings and shutter well, well, the right time for... for um, shutter speed and ISO. And these are all very useful things. But the master knows it's about light. That's the same. I would say there's an extra level above that, which is understanding narrative, which is why I started with that one in the first place. So here we are. We've got we've done two podcasts already. If you haven't watched them, if you go to YouTube dot com forward slash Kim Ayers. I've got a playlist called the McKinnon Collection where you can uh, find these uh, the previous podcasts. Go back and watch them. Um, even if you're not interested in 
actually taking part in the competition, uh, you are still, you know, hopefully you'll still learn something in terms of advancing your photography. So, unless you're watching the recording, here we are live on YouTube. Leave me a comment. There's a live chat option here. Say hello. Tell me where you're from. Tell me what the weather's like. And let's get a little bit of chat going. Now, I, I felt my glasses fall on the floor, so excuse me. One sec while I grab these. And I can see that there's some comments come in already. Um, now, I'm trying something out up here, which is to actually have the comments on a separate tablet, but, oh well, I've also got them on the screen over there. We'll just have to sort of, <laughs> only bouncing backwards and forwards between as I'm sort of still working out the technology for all this. So, comments we have already. Pat is saying, hello, um, another beautiful day in Somerset. Good evening, all. Uh, Nuria is saying good evening to you all from Exmouth. Meg says good evening, everyone. Um, and oh, of course, it is evening here in the UK and most of Europe and most of Africa. Uh, if you're in America, it's in the afternoon. If you're in Asia, it's the early hours of the morning, I think. Maggie, um, yes, uh, Maggie says, hello, a chilly evening in Castle Douglas. Um, Diane says, uh, always saying, hi, Maggie, but obviously not to the rest of us. <laughs> Jack says, hello, everyone. Nicholas says, good evening, all. Keith says, good evening, all. Brian says, hi, everyone, from Dumfries. Rosemary is saying, hello, from Western Washington, USA. Uh, Diane's from Warwickshire and Jim is saying hi everyone. That's great. We've got people in. We've got chat going. So what I'm going to talk about now is I'm going to talk about that notion of light in photography and generally speaking there's several different kinds of light. We can talk about ambient light, we can talk about front light, side light, back light, multiple light streams. Now we can get very, very complex with light, but I'm not going to get into really complex stuff because most people are going to be photographing in available light. However, hanging around or making sure you've, you're optimising that available light or going out on a day when you've got the kind of light you want can have a significant impact on your photography. So let's, let's throw up some photos. So what I'm going to do to, first of all is I want to talk about the fact that when we look at some of the photos from the actual McKinnon collection, there's something that we notice fairly early on. So if we look at this photo here, so this one is called um, Woman Spinning by Charles Reed and was taken about 1890. And so Whilst it's supposed to have that kind of sort of documentary feel, it's obviously a little bit staged. Um, I don't know whether this woman always sort of sat and did the spinning right outside her front door. Got a child there, possibly grandchild. Um, the main thing that I want to talk about with the light here is that it's not a strong light. It's just a kind, it's probably a dull overcast day with, you know, where the light is kind of spread around. There is no kind of hard light coming in. And for this, the, the, the thing to, one of the things to remember, and in fact, actually, let me just, because this is a really important thing to understand with light. And that is, the larger the light source, the softer the shadows. Okay, the bigger the light source, the softer the shadows. Now, to kind of demonstrate that, if you think about sunlight, sunlight creates a really hard shadow. Now, OK, we tend to think of the sun is a million times bigger than the size of the Earth, so surely a big light source. But it isn't. It's actually a pinprick in the sky. You can blot out the sun with the tip of your little finger held at arm's length. It is actually tiny in terms of the, the, uh, the, the sky. You know, we've only got a little pinprick of light. Likewise, flashes on the camera or on your phone also tend to give a very hard shadow. Like, because similarly, they are a small light source. Now, if you think about something like a window, a nice soft window light, not with the sun coming directly in, but say on a dull day or on the north side of the house, then you tend to get softer, creamier kind of shadows. So you don't get a hard dividing line. There's a sort of softness as, as the sort of shadow sort of moves across the face or whatever else it is you're lighting up. And then if you're out on a dull day, if you're outside and it's a cloudy day, Essentially, the whole sky becomes like, a, the, all the clouds become like a massive diffuser. The sun sort of hits and it spreads out and the, and the light is even from all, pretty much all angles that are above you. And in that case, we barely see any shadow at all. We might notice shadow under a car or, you know, something that's sort of got a very strong overhang. But beyond that, you don't really notice much shadow at all. 
So when we look at this photo, there's obviously shadow inside. You know, sort of flip back to this one. So when we look at this photo, there's obviously shadow inside the house, but outside there's not a lot of strong shadow, which makes me feel that it's probably taken on a fairly dull day. So let's take a look at another photo. Um, this one's called Sheep Shearing in Dumfriesshire. And again, what we've got here, a um, bunch of sheep shearers, several of whom don't really look like they want to actually have their photo taken and some who are just not going to bother and stop <laughs> stop sharing in order to uh, smile for the camera. Um, but again, what we have here is there isn't a, there are no strong shadows. It's just a very kind of sort of strong uh, is obviously an ambient kind of overcast day. Now, the thing about a lot of these photos that is uh, when we're going, if we're going back a century, if we're going, you know, in, in terms of uh, our photography, a lot of the old cameras really needed a lot of light in order to work. That the, so, you know, you needed, sometimes you're having something, I mean, the fact that even though it's outdoors here, you can see here, there's blurred movement with this person. So it's not a fast shutter speed. This is probably something like maybe a two second exposure, even though we're outdoors. Now, a modern camera is a two second exposure outdoors would just blow out everything. So they needed a lot of light. And as such, you don't tend to get so much in the way of indoor photos. Or if there are indoor photos, they tend to be next to a very big window and they tend to have a very long exposure time. So. Lighting in a lot of these old photos is very much dictated by daylight. Can you get the daylight and how much daylight can you get in and how long does everybody have to sort of stand and hold that pose in order for that exposure to happen? So that's kind of giving you that sense. Now, sometimes you can get the shots in direct sunlight. So in the case of uh, this next photo, this one is called uh, Sky Crofters Planting Potatoes. I think I showed this one yesterday or the day before. Now, in this case, we've got um, got a woman here with a basket full of seaweed and this woman planting it into the ground while the, the guy is presumably hoeing and you know, digging plows, a pl hand plow, really. Um, and But the thing is, what we can see here is that there's quite a hard shadow on this. If we look, you can see where the way the shadow is falling from the cap on his face and the ch under his chin. So now we're in, we are in direct sunlight. And the direct sunlight is coming pretty much straight towards him. And it's one of those terrible things. I remember it's almost like when I was, when I was young and sort of, you know, occasionally got to hold my dad's camera or something like that. I, we, I remember the, the general instruction we were always told was make sure when you're taking a photo, you've got the sun behind you so everything is lit up. And actually, since I've become a photographer, I've realized that's the worst piece of advice you can ever be given. Because if you're taking photos of people and the sun's behind you, the sun is going straight in their eyes and then it's making everybody squint. Also, it tends to be the least interesting form of light. Generally speaking, a lot when you're looking at photos, what really helps create a sense of depth, mood, character are the shadows. And if you've got the light coming straight, straight from the same direction as the photographer, you've not really got a lot in the way of shadows. Whereas if you turn the light sideways, suddenly the shadows become a lot more noticeable. So if we look at something like um, uh, this one here. So this one is of Glasgow University, taken by James Craig Annan in 1898. Now, we've got a landscape uh, so, I mean, it's uh, there, we don't have any people in here. We've got a boating pond uh, in the foreground. We've got trees and stuff. And then we've got Glasgow University in the tower. Now, what this is very care, very deliberately, the photographer here has chosen to the point whereby the light is not even coming from the side. The light is coming sort of from slightly behind. So the the this face of the tower is mostly in shadow. And you can see the way the shadow cuts across the uh, the rooftop there. So another one here, you can notice if you look at this spire here. So if you're wondering where the light sources come from, always find the shadow 
and work backwards. Opposite direction the shadows are going, that's where the light's coming from. So we can see then that the light is kind of coming almost directly side on to uh, the tower, but not far around enough for uh, this side to be in shadow. And what it does is it creates a very three-dimensional, we get this sort of real sense of it being a very three-dimensional building, in a way, which in a way that if it wasn't in shadow, if this had been taken on a dull day and the light, the ambient light had been the same on all sides of the buildings, you wouldn't really have had su quite such a sense of depth to it. So it's a very deliberately taken from this side rather than going around and taking it directly from the front because this really gives you that whole sense of the shape and feel of that kind of Victorian Gothic architecture. Um, now, similarly, if we go to this one here, which is North Galton, the Sacks in Orkney, taken by George Washington Wilton. Um, Wilson, sorry. This again has a side a side light coming onto it. And we can see here, again, by the shadows on the right of this stack that the sunlight isn't in it. So it's quite, again, if we kind of crop it, move in to where the, these lines are, it's a strong shadow. So this is in sunlight. So it's a strong sunlight, but all the, but the way, because the light is there, you've got all these very deep, darker shadows and it's really making the rock stand out. And it's giving it a much, again, on a dull day, you might look, you would have still got some of the texture, but you perhaps wouldn't have got as much texture. And also, if the light had been directly behind him as he took it, again, you wouldn't have maybe got quite such a sort of three-dimensional sense as you get because this side, this rock face is in shadow, and this side of the rock face is in shadow. This side light is really helping to define the textures of the landscape. So. Like I said, the, the, so that's the notion of kind of side light that, uh, that I wanted to, to talk about. Um, there are, in fact, actually, we'll just do one more with this. And, and that's this one. Now, this one is of the uh, RMS Queen Mary. And this was taken back in 1934, unknown photographer. Now here again, we have a side light. And in fact, the side light, that's first, we're veering on, we're kind of moving towards the idea almost of backlight at this point. Um, uh, because if you look at the shadow here, the shadow is coming actually towards us. So it's not from the side, it's from further round. And what we're getting with this is we're getting, the, we're not seeing much detail of the man here, but we are getting the outline of him, um, which, which, is, is becomes really interesting. Now, in reality, I think with the amount of side, you know, you see the shadow here of the anchor on the side of the boat. I th I'm surprised that, I don't think this was naturally this light. Um, the fact that if you look at the, uh, the crane here, it's very dark here, but as we move over to here, it fades out. And I think what's happened is this has been a very deliberate part of the printing process that they have deliberately um, overexposed the, the boat so that it looks more faded in the background. Otherwise, if this was really as dark as everything else, it would be so dominant, you, wouldn't, you would never actually notice the, the guy in the foreground. But having, but having it sort of faded also gives it a sense of depth. You get a sense of it being further away. And I must say, this one, there's that notion of almost retro-futurism. You know, despite the fact that for us, this boat was built 85 years ago. Uh, for them, this is like the newest, the most fantastic, greatest, you know, technological um, industrial achievement. Um, it almost has that feel of a kind of Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, like the old movies from the kind of 1930s and 40s feel to it. Um, but the side light here even though they faded it back in the background, is also helping to create much more in the way of definition. Um, okay, so I'll just pause there for a moment before I come on to, to backlight and just see if we've got any more comments coming in. Um, oh yeah, John's here, so it's better late than never. A little warmer in Ohio today. So welcome, John, glad you can make it. And Juan de, de, Delgado, Degadlo. 
Delgado, sorry. Um, I guess that's where uh, the photographer is in the light is also important. Yes, if you're talking about that one with the um, with the ship, having that man there in the light so that you're getting the shadow cast is helping to give us that sense of scale, but also give us that sense of the everyman who is there. He kind of represents us being there or inspired by the uh, by the boat. Right. OK, so we've had that idea of ambient overall dull light. We've had a little notion of side light. Then there's the notion of backlight. And so I'm going to show you an example of that then with um, where, where in essence, what, this one is called um, Dawn of Light and Liberty by John D. Stephen. It was taken about 1908. And this is up in Aberdeen. This is uh, the Wallace monu uh, Monument to, to William Wallace. Um, and so we've got, it's early morning, it's the dawn. We've got young lad out here carrying milk, uh, milk churns, milk canisters to deliver. Uh, similarly, over here as well. Now, this is all, this one was also hand tinted, hand coloured, uh, to try and give that sense of the dawn. Um, you know, taken back in a time when photography was black and white or sepia. So, the. But the thing here is, is getting that notion of the sunrise or the sun just about to rise means that most of the light is in the sky. So pretty much everything in the foreground is now in silhouette. And that creates a very different kind of mood when you're in silhouette to the when, the when you've got side light. Um, the, that notion of a kind of a back light, a light uh, sometimes called contre jour, shooting into the light, uh, into the day. It, um, so it's a, it's it as you can see it sort of changes. You can imagine if the light was behind you now and the church was lit up and the statue was lit up and the boy was lit up, it would have a totally different feel, a mood to it. Likewise, if it was lit from the side and you had much more, you would have much more of the landscape and the textures of the buildings and possibly the person. It would again have a very different mood to it. And this is really what I'm trying to get, what I want to get across to you today, is that notion of how changing the angle of the light dramatically changes the mood and feel of the photo. So then we can get much more. This one then was, is called um, A Cooperage of Whiskey Barrels on Speyside, unknown photographer taken around about 1930. And here we've got a much more complex, so we've got more than what you know we've got we've got obviously there's a light probably a large window or open door coming in here which is lighting up this guy at the front and catching part of the barrels in the back but there's also an open door in the background here which is allowing some light through now he's not this guy is not being lit by it but it is creating a patch of light behind him and that becomes really important for the composition of this that when you have another light source kind of further into it behind what's going on then it separates out the people in the foreground or the objects in the foreground from the background so this is about as sort of sophisticated as the lighting gets in the collection certainly the collection that's currently sitting in uh, Kakubri and this is probably you know this is one of the only indoor photo one of the very few indoor photos taken and we are up now into the 1930s you know you wouldn't really get a shot like this back in the 1890s there just wouldn't have been enough light going on especially to capture workmen at work where they would have been moving so this is kind of where we're wanting to come from is to start getting that real sense of light and how it um and how the, how it changes the impact and the mood of the story. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you some uh, some photos from my own photos to talk about other, you know, I mean, it's, it's great. It's lovely to look at these old photos and you go great. But if you're talking about you're wanting to take photos yourself for, for a modern Kakubri collection or even just for, for, for yourself, sometimes it's a little bit hard to relate to photos that were taken a couple of hundred years ago or a hundred years ago. Over, you know, 100 years ago and still kind of feel, well, 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 yeah, but how does, you know, we think of sort of somebody standing there on this sort of big old bellows camera on a giant tripod with a cloth over their head, which re doesn't relate at all to us whipping out our phone and just going click, click, click. 
So I want to show you some photos now of my own um, to just go and give you a sense of. So let's run through these different kind of light lighting scenarios then. So if we talk about that notion of the general ambient light. Now, quite often that does work fairly well for black and white photos. If, if you've got a really, if it's a dull day and, you know, there's just cloud overhead, there's not a lot in the way of shadows. Very often in colour, it tends to sap the colour out of the picture. All the colours are dull. They don't feel particularly vibrant. Um, but in black and white, it, the, what becomes really interesting then is tonal contrast. You're actually allowed a much greater tonal range in a dull light. When there's a strong sunlight, everything tends to be kind of hard highlights and hard shadows, and there's not a lot in between. When you've got um, a kind of more a, a dull day kind of light, there's much more in the way of these gradations. And so you can capture much more in the way of the subtle kind of um, textures uh, around. So, so this one here, I think I showed this one last night or the night before, notion of it got Alice camping early in the morning. It was a dull day, uh, dull morning, but you know, there's, there's plenty. She's wearing this tartan top and, you know, we can see all the texture in it and we can see all the pattern in it. Um, so that's that's the kind of our kind of equivalent of the ambient light, um, dull light part. Now, what it becomes more interesting then. So what happens when we talk about side light? So if we take this one here, um, now my daughter Meg is what currently watching. Um, she might recognize this one. This was taken, I think, um, 10 years ago, 14 years ago, something like that. Anyway, so <laughs> Meg, just a child here, um, doing the dishes. And with this one, this was just a bit of fun. I, the, she's standing, we've just got the window light. That's all there is, is the window light coming in. And I remember going, going into the kitchen, chat to her as she's, as she's doing the dishes, and I was just struck by how beautiful the light was and the way it was falling on, on her face. And what I was saying earlier about that notion of the window light, as opposed to a hard sunlight, this is a sort of north facing window. And look how, you can see how sort of soft, almost creamy the shadows are. Um, uh, it works, and, and on the soft skin of a, of a child, it, it, you know, it's a really beautiful kind of complementary light. Um, but then it doesn't just have to be on a child, here we go, this, this one of Christian Ribbons, which I took at, I think it was Wig, Wigtown Book Festival. Again, an indoor um, shot next to quite a large window. But a little bit like the uh, Cooperage one, there is a light behind as well that's hitting the wall. And that little light at the back kind of helps separate him out from the background somewhat as well. In fact, actually, I'm just thinking here, if I sort of zoom in to the... Yeah, the, the reflections in his eyes here, you just kind of start and you can partially make out where the, the, the window is off to the side here. But that notion then of the side light is really allowing for the rich textures and landscape um, of the face to, to, to come out. Um, we... It, it has, so it throws in a very, very different mood, regardless of his expression, regardless of anything else. You know that if this was lit from straight on, it would have a different feel to it than being lit from the side. Um, so what happens then if we move the light a little bit further around? Again, let's move into the idea of light coming from behind. So with this one then now what's happening is the light is the other side. Now it's not completely behind them, but it's, it's sort of that kind of, you know, 45 degrees behind the, the uh, behind them. So we've got the light coming in. We've, we, the, the light itself is just kind of capturing the edges of the face here, the edges of these antlers, which are being um, sewn into the well, not sewn into their hair, tied into their hair. Um, What's also happening here, though, is that there is obviously there's there's more I think I there's there's other bits where the light sunlight is reflecting back, so these people are not lost completely in silhouette, because that can happen. I'll actually I'll tell you what, I'll come on to that in a sec. Another example then indoor light band a band playing in a pub. This is the Yars. Um, 
very very small pub <laughs> um i think it probably held you know this 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 tiny little room um the the band were you know literally two foot away from the people in the front seat i'm on the front seat here i've got a wide angle lens but again what we've got is there's a there's a backlight now coming from the opposite side to to the last one but again about 45 degrees from my angle behind uh behind the, the singer and the accordion player and I always, I often say, I tend to feel that backlight is almost like the photographer's secret weapon. The, that once you start adding that into it, once you, if you look for opportunities for backlight, it becomes that little bit more magical. Now, if you don't have, uh, if you don't have something which is like like this one, like the last one, there's obviously the light, the main light source is coming in, but there's another light source, or there's enough white wall or something to be bouncing some of the light back if you don't have that then you end up with silhouette so this photo here um i took of a uh, fellow photographer alan wright landscape photographer we went out this down at kukubri um, near kukubri bay near sunset and i i i i took the photo the sun's going down we got the reflections on the sea and alan is in complete silhouette here and now that becomes really interesting because at this point then it is not about the detail it's about the outline and when you're looking at an outline when you're looking at a silhouette the brain starts trying to fill in all the details um we, it's something we've been primed for in our ev evolution from millions of years back that if we can see an outline we need to kind of have an idea what that might be an outline of because it might be uh, prey or it might be predator. It might be something we could eat. It might be something that could eat us. Um, so our brain is hardwired to start trying to fill in the details. So we look at this and of course any photographer instantly recognizes that here is somebody holding a camera and you can notice the little camera straps coming back. And so a photograph of a photographer at sunset. If you don't have the photographer, um, what you can also do is here's photos of woods now these woods are in the the mist as well so that's creating some interesting layers as it goes on but if you get that light behind so we've got all these trees and because it's slightly misty the trees that are closest to us are darkest as it as they sort of move further as you go deeper into the image um it ends up with a kind of a softer um they start sort of fading a bit the, the blacks aren't quite as deep so but at this point when you're talking about um when you're talking about uh, sort of silhouettes it's all about texture texture and line and form and you can have a lot of fun with that so if you consider the idea you're taking a photo of a bridge think of the number of different ways you could photograph that bridge according to the light that you could have the light sort of behind you and the bridge is lit up and it's all about maybe the maybe the, the bridge has got particular colors that you really want to emphasize or there's people on the bridge or there's a boat going under the bridge and you really want to capture the colors or maybe you've got a side light onto the bridge and you're picking up the textures and the uh, sort of in the structure of the bridge and maybe the bits that are around it alternatively you've maybe got the bridge in silhouette with the light behind it perhaps reflecting off the water coming under the bridge as well so you can see how just the way you decide to have the camera in relation to the light is going to make a profound difference. OK, so this notion then of here we've got strong silhouette, but then you can also sort of deliberately play with it so that in the case of this one, here we have a uh, dancer, Alexandra. And with this one, what we've done is the light is not fully behind her, but it's sort of slightly to one side and behind and um but I've, we've, we've shot her against a black background and so her body is mostly in silhouette except for the outline and because she's a dancer she was able to create these fantastic shapes and lines with her body and so this becomes almost like doing it's like sketching or like chalk drawing on black parchment um where you're just going for the edges and it's all about line and texture on that line and not about what the whole body is like. It's just about the curve of the arms, the curve of the legs, 
the way the light is catching it. So you, if you so you you couldn't get this effect in any other way than having a light behind the subject because if the light was further around to the side it would also be an interesting photo but you would have then much more of the body in shot and with this we didn't want the whole body we just wanted the outline so hopefully these these kind of ideas are starting to give you a sense of how you can play with light um, excuse me one sec that's what I So I'm chatting away here, giving you some ideas. I'm going to carry on talking about light. If you've got any thoughts, observations, comments you want to throw in, questions that you have, do please just drop them into the comments and I'll uh, try and make sure I get back to them. OK, right. So where are we? So, OK, yes, no. So we've got this thing of the fact that we're talking about light and if the light is behind, it throws everything into silhouette. Now, what you can also do then is if we come to here, here's a shot where I'm deliberately using the sun as a backlight, but I didn't want silhouette. So what I've done is I've created another light off to the side. So I'm using what they call a fill light. Um, so just sort of out of shot, slightly to the right side of the camera, I've got a flash going off. Now, the thing about using the sun as the backlight is it that it's given us this wonderful edge, this sort of wonderful golden edging halo glow around our fantastic Mr. Fox here. And he's got a wonderful chicken sitting there with these, the sheep that wonderfully, fantastically just wandered up into view to see what was going on. Uh, the light, of course, is then coming through the wine glass. Little, you can actually catching a little kind of hot spot there. Um, so another little one as it's kind of working its way through the wine bottle. But what we've done here is if you want to follow the shadows the other way, if you look at the shadows on the bag, you'll see that there's a light source coming from uh, to, to, from the side of the viewer. And it's not just all coming from behind. So this notion then of um, playing with more than one light. Now, if you don't have another uh, off camera flash that you want to do, a reflector. You get a big reflector and you can get by reflectors really cheaply um, or even a large piece of white card. You get somebody to hold it. You can bounce some of the sunlight back onto the subject and thereby fill in the shadow. So you can this. So what we're doing now is we're getting this kind of double sense of light going on. But even if you don't have, um, you know, the, the, the full thing, sometimes you can sort of create. Now, this is my grandson, Cormac. We're out in the woods. And again, the woods themselves are creating a sort of a certain amount of, you know, there's light reflecting off other bits of trees. So the sunlight is behind him and it's just starting to catch his, catch his hair. But because the, the sun is above the layer line of the trees, the trees themselves, slightly, slightly misty day as well. I mean, that mist is also, I will say, helping to create a sort of surrounding um, ambient, reflecting the light around a little bit more. So we managed to get this lovely kind of halo effect like we did on the Fantastic Mr. Fox, but he's not in shadow. I don't have a second light here, but the, the light is sort of refracting on, reflecting off the mist around and some of the, the, the trees and, the, and what have you. I think probably in the editing process, I probably had to lighten up some of the shadows with this one as well. Other forms of backlight. Now, the other, th the other thing with backlight is, um, <laughs> One group of people who have understood this for a long time have been musicians and performers, stage performers. And if you think about when you go off to, uh, to see a big band in concert and they've got all the dry ice going, they've got all the smoke going, and then they have big racks of lights up and behind them. And that's because when you get light then cutting through mist, it sort of disperses and goes in off on all sorts of wonderful directions. So if you can get hold of smoke, if you can get hold of mist, fog, and then have the light behind it so the light's coming through it, you can get some really amazing effects. So this we now know, you know, we recognize as a very kind of typical band shot. Yeah, this is uh, King Charles, I think he's called. This was playing at the Eden Festival several years ago. So, the light is up and behind him, but it's coming through the smoke. 
And so it's refracting, we get these wonderful shadows within, the, you know, part of him silhouetted, part of him is lit up, and we're kind of getting shadows in the fog, shadows in the mist, or in the, in the smoke. Um, it's a very, very kind of powerful effect. So, okay, let me show you another one. I, I did a shoot for um, Cafe Largo, and one of the shots, I didn't actually intend this one. This is where the front light that I had did fail to go off. So you've only got the backlight. We've got a smoke machine going, and uh, but it becomes really moody and atmospheric. You can see the two flashes I've got on stands here. We've got one over here, we've got one over here. I've got a, I've, I've just sort of run around with a smoke machine to sort of create all this texture. Um, and the, we, so we've got the backlight. We've got this sort of hitting the sides of faces. It's very moody now. When we actually did get the, um, the, the, the front light to work, and we did it in colour, this was the shot we were actually going for. Totally different mood and feel, quite apart from the fact that it's in colour, um, which obviously changes it as well. So again, back to this idea, you can always play with colour, you can play with black and white. The, the reality is, all our, uh, we're long past the days when you went and bought your analog, you went and bought film for your analog camera and you had to decide whether you were going to choose black and white film or colour film. Your modern day cameras, all digital cameras, your phone, unless you ch deliberately change the settings on them, will automatically shoot in colour. Shoot them in colour and then even on your phone you have options to turn them to black and white. So it's often worth playing around a little bit, sort of shoot them in colour, see what the colours look like, try black and white, does it work better? If it doesn't, go with the colour, if you feel it does, stick with it in black and white. Um, one of the, a, a much, a, another shot that I'll show you here, which was a kind of really quite sophisticated setup, was when we did a, I got a chance to do a shoot, which we decided to style in the theme of uh, Peaky Blinders. Peaky Blinders being this 1920s Birmingham gangsters drama that was on the BBC. I think there's been four or five series so far. I think there's another one due out this year. And so um, I think it was somebody's birthday, a group of friends had already started getting outfits. And so we managed to, we went to an abandoned warehouse. I was playing around with smoke bombs and lights and colored gels in the lights. And this is one of the shots from that. And this was, um, so at this point, what we've got is I've got the smoke going off. I've got two lights behind them. There's a, there's a light just the other side of this door, which you can see sort of reflecting off this guy's shoulder. There's another guy, light just behind this guy. You can see the catching there. We've got a side light coming in from over here. And then I've got a key main light just slightly to my left as we're just to kind of fill in the shadows a little bit. But most of the light is actually coming from the three flashes that are, and the, the two behind have also got orange gels over them, and I think there's maybe a blue gel over on the one on the right as well. So now you've got colour, and it's hitting the smoke, and it's dispersing, and it's bouncing around all over the place, and there's bits of shadow cutting across, um, and it becomes very, very dramatic and moody. So if you get a chance to sort of ever play around with smoke bombs, they are a huge amount of fun. But the best way to do it with your playing with the light is try and get a light source the other side, get it behind the smoke. And then that's where the magic really tends to happen. Um, oh, I can see I've got a question here. Meg says, uh, do you ever have light coming from underneath? Oh, now that's an interesting one. Generally speaking, not very often. The, with light, with lighting system, we, we're, nearly all our light tends to come from above. And if it's, even if it comes from the side, it comes from directly on side. We don't tend to very often get light from below. And this is because again, throughout most of our evolution, um, light has always come from the sun, from the sky, from above us. So our brains are tuned to the idea that if we see something, the, sh the way shadows fall, we're expecting the shadows to sort of come down. So, or if the sun is on the horizon, maybe we'll get a nice side light, but it's very rare for you to get the light coming from underneath. However, do I have enough? I'm not sure. I used to have a little torch 
sitting around here somewhere. Um, oh, doesn't look like I do. It's a shame because I was going to we'll show you what that looks like. Did I? I'm sure I have one sitting on here somewhere. Oh, well, no, never mind. Oh, no, I do. Here we go. Right. So let me just show you what happens if I take a light here and I shine it from underneath my face. Now what? Now this is a very typical, you know, when you're a child and you're doing Halloween stories and you, you get a candle and you hold the candle underneath and you light yourself from underneath. And the reason for lighting yourself underneath like this is because it looks spooky. It looks weird. It just looks wrong. And so that unsettles you. And so it's very deliberately done so, you know, we hold the candle or the torch under our faces deliberately to unsettle because we're trying to spook out the audience as we're telling our story. Our little horror tale of, of ghosts and ghouls and um, escaped maniacs and, and whatever the, the story may be. And it looks wrong because of just what I've been saying, that for the whole of our evolution, light has always come from above or from the side. You just very rarely ever get light from underneath. You might occasionally get a bit of reflected light off water uh, that sort of bounces up. But it's rare. It's not something we're used to seeing. So really good question. Thanks for answering, asking that one, Meg. Uh, what else have we got here? So oh, Diane says, what settings are used for the, these night shots, please? Um, not sure which night shots you mean, Diane. The, the, um, if we're talking about these shots, uh, or the last couple of shots that I've shown you, it's really a case of what you're trying to do is your well, if you're using off-camera lights, it's trial and error. It's so, so much depends on the power of the light source you've got, on the particular camera you've got, and all of the camera settings. So the thing to really do is play and experiment. You, you take your first shot, take your best guess, and then if you've not got enough light, you either make a wider aperture or you slow down your shutter speed or you increase your ISO. Now, at this point, I could get quite technically complicated. Um, for a lot of cameras, modern cameras, if you're, if you're not uh, uh, really getting into your camera, the auto settings cope with things reasonably well. About seven or eight times out of ten, your auto settings will do quite well. However, when you are shooting in low light conditions, or quite often your auto settings don't work, and that's where it's useful to know how to override these things. I discuss these tend to be much more in my, my weekly podcast. So I'll talk a little bit about that um, uh, afterwards. But if you if you attend the, the, my regular Sunday afternoon podcasts, then um, I'm very often talking about different kinds of light and and settings on cameras. Um, so with like I say with the, with this particular shot, I've, I've essentially got four different lights. I've got two with orange gels behind these guys. I've got one with a blue gel off to one side, and then I've got one with without any gels, just slightly over my shoulder to make sure that they're that they're not lost completely in shadow. So this is where you can get. But even if you don't have off camera flashes and the like, um, you can you can still sometimes end up in places with fairly multiple light sources. So. Let's let's move on to let's come back to kind of in a way natural light. So this was taken at the Kakubri Galleries a couple of weeks ago. Now, currently, as to be said, the cafe is closed for the month of February. I think um, the previous people who are running the uh, running the cafe. I, th I think the person retired, and they're putting in place um, new people who are going to take it over. However, when I was in there for the day. Um, Rather nice coffee. You see, it says here, Kakubri Galleries, <laughs> um, with that logo. But the point I wanted to make with this cup of coffee, though, is that what we've got here is we've got a couple of different light sources. Is that actually just off to my left, or slightly behind me and to the left, there's a large window. And so this window light is coming in, and this is what's lighting up the front part of this coffee. In the background, we've got the lights coming from the cafe and the stairwell. So we've got that sort of very kind of sort of yellowish tint light in the background. And in turn, the kind of it's it's sort of the because you've got the yellow there, it's kind of giving almost a blue opposite color thing, a bluish tint to the ambient, the, the daylight that's coming through from the window. 
So your end gallery is actually quite a complicated lighting setup, even though what we're talking about, I don't have any off-camera flashes or artificial lighting. I'm just using a mixture of the light of what's inside the gallery and the window that's coming in, uh, the light that's coming in from the window. So you can always try and play around with that as well. If you're inside a building and there are lights on, is there also a window light? Is there an interaction? Is there something going on with the way that lighting is going? And this is part of what I'm hoping to try and get across this evening, is the idea of I want you to start looking at light in a different way. Don't just go, this is the accepted light, but are there other places in this place, you know, in this building, in this room, outside, where I can change the direction of the light or see whether there's more, even more than one light source coming? and how will that actually impact on, on the photos that I'm taking. So let's, okay, so that's, that's kind of playing around with that. Like something else I want to talk about though, is the notion of if you're doing outdoors, and let's face it, with the, the idea of this, this competition for Kukubri, um, Kukubri and its surrounds. So this collection, I think will partly be about, you. I, there might be room for landscapes and bits and pieces, but we're also really wanting people. I mean, when we look at a lot of these old photos from the McKinnon collection, some of the landscapes are, fair, are interesting. Some of the township shots are more interesting because we can look at the town and we can go, oh, look how much that's changed since, since you know, in the, in the last 120 years or whatever. But what we really love are the pictures of the people. So it's, it's worth, you know, thinking about the people within. However, if you are outside and you are thinking of photographing an urban town landscape, you may want to think about how light difference, how different kinds of light interact with an urban scene. Now, what I mean by this then is, um, Actually, sorry, quick, uh, quick question before we move on to that then. So, oh, April saying hi, everyone. <laughs> In a bit late April, we're moving towards the end of it, but I'm sure you can do catch up afterwards. Uh, Rosemary says, when you mix light sources indoors, how do we set our white balance? OK, that's an interesting question. Certainly, uh, I, I don't know what options people might have on their phones for this, but a lot of uh, most modern digital cameras or certainly DSLRs have a white balance option. And again, it a little bit depends here whether you're trying to get everything in camera or whether you are going to be editing afterwards. If you're going to be editing afterwards, most editing software allows you to adjust that white balance. So you can actually take the slider, move it to the left or right and make it bluer or make it um, yellower. In fact, actually, I'll tell you what I will do just quickly to show you this. If I go, to, if I open this in Photoshop, uh, it will give me, um, I can, if I go to file, uh, so no, filter, I'm going to open this in camera raw filter. So I've got here, over here, I actually have a white balance setting. Now I can do auto and it subtly changes it. Let's just undo that. Or I've got some temperature sliders here. So if I slide this to the left, it makes everything bluer. If I slide it to the right, it makes everything more yellow. And then I've got another one under here, slide it to the left and it makes everything more green, slide it to the right and it makes everything more purple. So I can go purple and blue and create, oh, that's a really kind of sickly color, I can go more yellow, more green, more yellow and purple. So we can play around with these little sliders and sort of decide on where we feel that the best mix comes. So in the editing process, you can play with the white balance. If you're playing, if you're using the white balance directly in your camera, I would just say, first of all, put it on auto, because again, eight to nine times out of 10, it will probably get the best balance for you. If you put it on auto and then you look at it and go, Ugh, try some of the other settings. Quite often you'll find that there are some several settings like an indoors, a cloudy, a strong sunlight, a tungsten light um, settings. And so flip through those and see what happens. And then there, there is no kind of one size fits all with this. The thing to do is play, take a photo, look in the back of your camera, get a sense, make adjustments, take another photo, make adjustments, take another photo. And that's really the best way to do it. So hope that helps and uh, makes a bit of sense, Rosemary. Um, okay, so yes, what are we going to talk about now, though, is if we are outdoors, if we are taking a photo of the town or whatever in different kinds of light. So this here is a photo of Whitby down in northern England. 
It's a panorama of about five photos, I think, stitched together. Um, you've got the the old abbey up on the hill opposite. We've got the, the harbour coming in, um, moving up to the bridge. This bridge opens to allow boats to pass through it. Now, so there's a particular place you can stand and you can kind of rest your camera on a little kind of gate post and sort of go click, 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 click and move around and then string them all together. Or a lot of modern phones even have a panoramic option where as long as you hold it fairly steady and you can move it slowly, it will sort of string a panorama together for you. Now, the thing is, is that I did this photo twice. I did it once during the day and judging by the shadows, probably about mid afternoon. So the shadows are starting to get a little bit longer. Um, so we're part, you know, we're, we're well past noon here, but we're not quite down to sunset yet. Then I went back just after the sun had set into what's known as the blue hour. Now, plenty of people have heard of the golden hour and the golden hour is this point, which is usually the one hour or so before sunset or the hour or so just after sunrise, when the sun is very low in the sky and it casts kind of golden haze over everything, hence the called golden hour. Now the blue hour is the opposite side of where the sun is. So it's just is the hour or so before the sun rises or the hour or so after the sun sets. So there's still some color in the sky, but we don't have the sun out. Now, when you combine that idea of there's still a bit of blue in the sky with the fact that the sun's gone down and the street lights come on, then you end up with something like this. And this is one of the best times to do this kind of uh, urban photography. It's a really interesting one because you then again, you get this cross between the kind of yellowy, orangey, warm glows of the street lights and the house lights and um, what have you, along with that bluish tinge that you get, you still got in the sky. And if there's water about as well, like there is here, you get the blue, the deeper blues in the water. So at this point then, you know, the, the abbey is starting to get lit up. Now, half an hour to an hour later, the sky would all just be completely black there. But as we sort of look into the town, the, the, the lights have come on and, you know, it's, it, it is something really quite lovely about that colour contrast, which black and white wouldn't really do it for you. So if you're going to take colour photos and you're going to take colour photos in a town, very often this is a really good time to be able to do it. Um, oh, April says, I love the blue hour on this photo. <laughs> so why is why I chose it. Thank you. Um, or here's, here's one from um, Castle Douglas. This was taken, obviously, <laughs> just, just, just on the run up to Christmas because we can see uh, we've got the various kind of Christmas lights still sitting about. And this was one point where it was just... Um, I think, I can't remember, somebody yelled out, they sort of look out the kitchen window and the sky was just absolutely glorious. And I thought, oh, I wonder what that's like over the town. So I quickly just grabbed my camera, ran across the street, took this shot looking down the length of Castle Douglas High Street. So again, we're into the, the sun has now set, although we've got the glorious colors bouncing off the clouds. But at the same time, while the street lights have just come on, the Christmas lights have come on, and so you can see the shop lights have, have come on as well. So we've now got these wonderful little warm glows that are coming, you know, car headlights. So we've got that mix of light and shadow and play and color, rich, rich color. So, you know, play around. If you can get out, you know, if, the, if there's an interesting sunset or if the sky is clear and you can, you can go out into the blue hour, it's always a lot of fun to be had um, in urban environments. Another fun thing urban environments is fog. Now, fog during the day, you might not see much, but sometimes if you get the fog at night, you get these little kind of pockets and then drop that into black and white and you get something like this. And it almost looks like a bit like a scene from The Exorcist, I think. <laughs> really quite spooky and otherworldly, uh, deathly quiet. So again, again, actually, I think this is one, I don't know what time, it could well have been actually about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Obviously, it wasn't it, it wasn't that busy. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to stand in the road to take this photo. Um, but here, when you've got that notion of the fog, um, you know, and the light cutting through it at night time, um, again, very, very atmospheric. So play around with the different weather systems, really, is what I'm talking about here. And if I'm talking about weather, snow, you know, um, this was several years ago when we don't normally get snow like this in Castle Douglas. It has to be said, this was exceptional. Now, I know there's some of you who are watching this in America 
part, certain parts of America, you know, this is, you know, barely, <laughs> barely a scattering of snow. You know, you'll be used to the idea of sort of digging out sort of six foot of snow from your driveway every day. However, here in this this part of southwest Scotland, this level of snow is really unusual. Um, hence the reason I had to rush out and take it. But again, the, we're here with the snow coming down. The snow was really quite thick and it kind of acts a bit like fog. Everything in the background just gets fainter and fainter and fainter. And here we've got that clock tower again, just sort of disappearing um, out of sight. Um, we've got somebody walking up here. They, they decided that walking on the road is probably safer than trying to walk on the pavement. I seem to remember doing that myself. Um, so we've got all these kind of things. So th this is um, this is really what I want you to be thinking. Of. And you can see how the light changes depending on the weather patterns that you're using as well. So it's really something to worth worth keeping in, in in mind. The last thing that I want to kind of talk about in terms of light is the notion of actually playing with the shadows themselves. Just do a couple of quick things here. You, I've done whole podcasts on shadows, in fact, just one particular kind of shadow. So you can have the shadow where a shadow is cast. So if you've got like a single light source, um, you, know, you might even use car headlights for that matter, or um, a light coming down from a street light or something like that, then sometimes what happens is the shadows can become just as interesting, not just the shadows that are on somebody, like we were talking earlier about the light that comes through a window, but here what we've got, the, the part of the strength of this photo is the shadow that's cast behind Jessica here as she's she's throwing her hair back. I've got a really fast shutter speed. A flash goes off. I think it's 250th of a second or thereabouts. The hair catches in, in mid-flight. But look at the, that fantastic outline on the wall in the background. That's what I was after. I can't remember how many shots I took before I got the one that I wanted. It took a few. Um, Jessica was great, kept her in her hair, but the hairdresser was going nuts because he'd spent so much time doing the hair. <laughs> but I was after that shadow. So don't forget the, way, the fact that the way light can actually fall on things can affect shadows as well. And then one last shadow one that I want to show you here is where I've been using the blinds. The, the, the blinds that I've got in my, this was actually taken um, just literally three feet in that direction. So the blinds that I have in front of my window in my study, um, took this photo of Denise and the sun was coming in and we decided to, where you get all the shadows of the light coming through the blinds and the shadows going across her. Um, so this is, this is really what I'm trying to show you is, is just to have this idea then that this light is an incredibly powerful tool in your toolbox. When you are creating photos, when you are trying to express a narrative, to, to get a mood across to the viewer, when you want somebody to pick up this photo and look at this photo and get a feeling that represents the feeling you are trying to, to, to express, then light is one of the most powerful tools you've got. Composition, absolutely, you need to know how to lay these things out. And as I said, if you didn't see it before, just go to youtube.com uh, forward slash Kim Ayers. Or currently, these three podcasts are also on the Kakubri Galleries website in the competition page. Uh, so they've been put in there as a reminder. So if you've missed any of these, you can go back and take a look at them. So the competition then, the competition we are looking to create a Kakubri collection of photos. I'm not entirely sure exactly how many yet, but we're probably talking about 30, 40-ish kind of photos. Maximum number you can submit is three per person, and they do need to be high enough resolution such that we can print them up, because the whole idea is that we are going to then print this collection and have an exhibition on later on in the year. So if you live in or around Kakubri and you can go and take some shots, please do. If you've been on holiday to Kakubri and have some fantastic photos sitting in your folders and collections that you want to clean up and tidy up and enter, then go to the Kakubri Galleries website, find the competition page, or currently in the description of this podcast, I've got a link going directly there where you can find all the information you need um, uh, and the terms and conditions along with the submission form. So that's pretty much where we're at. This is pretty much drawing us to the conclusion of the um, the, the, these podcasts. If you found these uh, interesting and would like, like you quite like my style of doing uh, podcasts, I do a podcast every single week on a Sunday at 3pm 
UK time, uh, youtube.com forward slash Kim Ayres. Go there, subscribe, click the little bell for notifications to, and for reminders for uh, that. I've also got a Facebook group which you can join as well. What I would also ask is we do have also in the description of this uh, of this podcast, there is a feedback form. We would be so grateful if you could please go and fill that in. If you just want to sort of tick the tick the boxes, yes, no, five stars, whatever, it will take you 30 seconds, 45 seconds max. Um, there are a couple of little places where you can um, leave extra comments um, if you wish. These were always helpful too. It's uh, This is the first time I think Kukubri Gallery says, well, it is the first time they've done a competition and we've done the podcasts and what have you to go with it to try and encourage people, give them ideas of ways they can approach photography for this. So getting as much feedback as we can on that is extremely useful. Right, so... That pretty much brings us to uh, our conclusion. Thank you ever so much to um, everybody who's turned up, um, joined it. I can see there's a couple more comments here. Just, just lastly, read this. Uh, what have we got here? Oh, April says, great shot of the black and white snow scene. Um, a shot like this looks best in black and white. I've often found, actually, snow scenes nearly always look like they're in black and white. Anyway, it seems to sap the colour out of things. Um, John says, shooting in the fog always makes for dramatic and interesting photos. Love to shoot in the fog. That's really true. Um, Rosemary is saying, highly recommend a Sunday podcast. And April agrees. And so does John. Oh, there you go. We're sort of well and truly um, endorsing the podcast if you're interested in taking any more. Keith says, thanks very much. And we'll complete the form short shortly. Um, excellent. Right. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, thank you to Kakubri Galleries for this opportunity. And um, yeah, if you fill in the form and... Um, Oh, it was shown as saying one one last thing. Let's just double check that. Oh, I, I'm getting a thank you from um, from Shona for for everybody at the at the Kukubri Galleries. Excellent, much appreciated. I do hope that you've enjoyed these three podcasts. As I said earlier, if you haven't seen either of the other two, then you can either go to youtube.com forward slash Kim Ayers, go to the McKinnon Collection. One other thing I will say is if you enjoyed looking at some of these photos, the, the, these old photos from the McKinnon Collection, also you will find on the, in the, on the Kim Ayers YouTube page and also on the Kakubri Galleries website, um, there's a, a, long, a, a discussion that I did with Blake Miltier, who is the curator of the McKinnon Collection. And we discussed several of the photos talked about, um, he, he, he was telling me about the photos, where they come from, what the uh, McKinnon collection is about, the kind of information they're looking to collect about the photos, how people can help. And then I was looking at these photos from the photographer's point of view. And it's a quite a nice discussion, goes backwards and forth. Um, so take a look at that uh, as well. Thank you very much uh, to everybody once again. And um, hopefully maybe I will see some of you on Sunday's podcast or another Sunday. Um, but thank you once again to Kukubri Galleries and do go and check out the McKinnon Collection if you get the chance and please do enter the competition. Cheerio. Bye bye.